December 2021, a podcasting duo set themselves a mission to watch and review all four of the films in the Dirty Dozen franchise. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Dirty Dozen December on Fighting on Film. I love that jingle. It's great, isn't it? It is good. I wonder who did the voice, Matt. Do you know? (laughs) (laughs) Welcome back, everyone, to Dirty Dozen December. And we are back on week two. And we we bring you our review of Dirty Dozen, The Next Mission. Dirty Dozen 2, Dirty Harder. (laughs) Dirty Dozen (laughs) 2. Why am I 20 years older, but it's still 1944? (laughs) Will this never end? (laughs) <laughs> so very Paul, Paul E. Quiet. Marvin's been through a time warp. Um, <laughs> yeah, eighteen years have passed, but in reality, just just a couple of months, three months, yeah, four months since June nineteen forty four, and yeah. he's he's back at it again with an, a new dozen. In the words of Captain Erickson, it's the war, the whole bloody war. <laughs> yeah. So, so what's the plot? What's the plot of the next mission, Rob? So the plot of Dirty Dozen Two, the next mission. I mean, it's quite madcap it's like something out of a commando book isn't it if the first yeah. one wasn't enough um the plot of this one quite simply is lee marvin yet again is recruited to raise a band of prisoners to execute a mission of daring do and this mission is to stop a plot to kill hitler whatever you do don't bloody kill hitler in the words of ernest borgnine hitler's our best ally <laughs> any danger fire fans out there <laughs> and remember kill hitler <laughs> <laughs> danger fire <laughs> um yeah it's inevitable isn't it there has to be a danger five reference in that um oh, that's great but yes it's it's so bizarre it's, it's such an interesting premise they dredging up this whole hitler was germany's you know worst enemy at this point of the war and he was making all the wrong decisions and he, yep. which there's an element of truth too obviously hitler mm. was making some pretty bad decisions by 44 onwards and earlier um but it's weird to see a film with a premise that is based around that idea yeah, it, it, as I say, it feels like a commando book like yeah. plot, doesn't it? It's a bit more um, outlandish than Dirty Dozen, isn't it, really? Yeah, definitely. Um, but whether it's better in execution, we shall see. Mm-hmm. So I'll just give you a quick brief rundown of the crew and the production, and then we'll, we'll dig into the cast. So this one was directed by Andrew V. McLagan, or McLagan. Um, who fans of the show will know he directed The Wild Geese, The Sea Wolves, Devil's Brigade. He's no stranger when it comes to war movies. It was released on NBC television in the US um, on February the 4th, 1985. It was produced by MGM Television, distributed by Warner Brothers. It was shot in England again, akin to the first film in Twickenham Studios. The aircraft that were used were provided by Aces High, who are now Aviation Films Limited, and they provide planes to the, 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 the cinema industry. And the cinematography was by John Stanier, who worked on Rambo 3 and Life of Brian, and the firearms were by Baptiste. And to be fair, that is what I could find. There's just so little online. That, that's about it, isn't it, really? Um, it, it, a lot of the railway scenes were filmed at uh, Neen Valley, yep. um, Bluebell Railway. So this could have really been sponsored by like English Heritage Railways, couldn't it, really? But yeah, it could have been, yeah. And Ashridge House uh, is uh, the backdrop for uh, Marston Tyne military prison again. Yes. From the first movie. And they recreate that that um, shot where Lee drives drives in. Well, in, in the jeep. first movie, it's the hearse arriving. Yeah. And then he and then in this movie, Lee drives a jeep in. And it's the same same shot from... I, yeah, I thought... Is it the same shot from the first movie? I thought it was. I looked I looked back, it's not, because... It, ah. it replicates the hair shot, and then Lee, after he's had the meeting with Borgnine, spoilers for Dirty Dozen One, by the way, after he's had the mis- <laughs> the the mission briefing in uh, the first movie with Ernest Borgnine, uh, General Warden, yep. he drives a jeep, but it cuts it cuts to him just at the gate, ah. um, so it's different. So they reshot that, and there's a different truck there and stuff. It's nice to see it though. It like... is. But the, the sign looks identical. But yeah, I mean, it's like, it's literally that first half of the movie is Dirty Dozen 1 redone for TV. Like, it's just identical. Yes. Beat for beat. Beat for beat the same. Um, But yeah, before we go into plot a little bit deeper, we'll talk about the cast, of course. So Lee Marvin again is back as Major Reisman, and he's 61 years old at this point, Marvin. Um, Because that's one of the big issues with the movie. It's not, well, it's not a big issue, but... 
everyone who <laughs> isn't a new member of the cast is 20 years old older yeah but it's set in 1944 which is just perplexing but if you can get over that it's it doesn't really matter when you can project that kind of bravado and vibe the way that lee is in these two films you can kind of get away with it can't you yeah he carries the film at points doesn't he by just being him he he definitely carries the film yeah i was so relieved that it wasn't creaky lee marvin yes stumbling through it and like i'm here for the money because that was gonna be that was my worry but there's times when he's genuinely having fun, and that's why I wanted yeah. to see. He's enjoying it. and There's these little wry smiles. There's these little yeah. wise cracks you tell he's having fun with, um, which is just nice to see. So Ernest Borgnine is back as uh, Major General Sam Warden. Uh, fans of the show will remember him from uh, Codename Wild Geese. And interestingly enough, he, that was the last movie he did before this one came out. And... He was in Airwolf at the time. Yeah, I, I completely forgot he was in Airwolf. And then you told me just before we started recording, I was like, oh, yeah, of course. So he was busy with TV work with, at that point. It's, it's, it's weird. It's, it's an odd performance. He doesn't really need to be in it, but he's in it. And it's slightly for the better for it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's nice to see all these old faces, isn't it? It is. I feel like he was contractually obliged to, to have a train set and to play golf in the film and get a hole in one. Yeah, definitely. Because, yeah, I, he has a little bit more fun with it as well, doesn't he, in this film, with the role? More of comic relief than really serious. Mm, it's less straight, that's for sure. A, bit, a lot less straight in it, yeah. And then you've got Richard Jekyll playing Sergeant Byron, one of the MPs. Yeah, back again. Or the MP. Yeah, he's the MP, you know. Yeah, he, he makes the right decision about not going on the mission this time because he, he just disappears. He had a stomach full the last time. He's like, no, no I'm, not, I'm not doing this again. Last time was close enough. <laughs> I'll be in the rear with the gear. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're into the new dozen. Or yes. Baker's dozen. Because I think there's like 13 of them. And then one of them goes. And then there's, there's a couple eight, that bump them off them, really and quick. And you don't see three of them. Like three of them aren't introduced no, at all. No. Um, it's like the, f- the first film. They're just filler. <laughs> they're the filler dozen. Yeah. So Matt, do you want to start giving us a rundown of the new dozen? Uh, not, not, not really, but okay. <laughs> Wait, just pick some of them out. Pick some They're very them. forgettable, aren't they? They um, are a bit, unfortunately. T- to be fair, some of them have interesting um, backstories. Uh, yes. There's a, a French uh, deserter, uh, um, Didier Leclerc, played by mm-hmm. Jay Benedict, um, who's a AWOL from the French army and yeah. is... Uh, has joined the American army. I I don't know what's going on there. He's going to be hanged for desertion from the American army, which he joined after deserting from the French army because the French army wants to guillotine him after the American army's hung him. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Then we've got um, the main cast, uh, the main dozen. Uh, We've got Sam Sixkiller, played by uh, Sonny Lantham, um, who's a a Native American GI. So we've got our... uh, Posey esque character there. Yes, yep. Um, hitting that uh, beat. Then we have Arlen Dreggers, who is a former Philadelphia police sniper. Cool. Um, yeah. But he's sentenced to hanging um, for shooting an officer that yeah. had just raped a French lady. And he's played by Rico Ross, who, of course, went on to later play Frost in Aliens. Yeah. Yeah, this um, is his first role. This is his very first. Well, first major credit, I think. Yeah. Um, then we have Otto Deutsch, who's played by Stephen Hattersley, and he's a German-born American who has a chip on his shoulder that he is German, but he wants to die a, an American soldier, yep. in his words. Uh, then we have uh, Louis Valentine, who's played by uh, Ken Wall, mm-hmm. and uh, he's an embittered jazz drummer um, that got into a knife fight with the boyfriend of a transvestite cabaret singer. Yeah. Now that that sounds like a film in itself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, like they all have fairly interesting backstory. Yeah, they. But they're good. None of it really comes back. Uh, Robert E. White, who is played by Rolf Saxon, um, and he's a rapist uh, mm-hmm. and a murderer. He's the bad boy of the group, isn't he? Really. He's uh, like Maggot. Maggot cum Franco. Yeah. Because no one really gets any real time to have any real ca- character development or yeah, anything yeah. really, mm. which is a shame. And then we've got Tommy Wells, who is played by Larry Wilcox, and he is um, probably best known for being uh, the guy out of Chips. Um, yeah, he was Baker. 
Baker, that's right, the the, the blonde guy out of Chips, I've, I've forgotten his name. Um, and he's a, a Southern crop duster uh, pilot who survives the mission, spoilers, yep. um, and flies the survivors out. Interesting enough, he has a, 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 a almost a connection with Marvin because he himself was a Marine Corps vet. Oh, right, okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, Interesting. and he served in Vietnam. Yeah. Okay. Um, then we have, finally, we have Comrade E. Perkins, played by Gavin O'Hearley. Um, and he had been in, uh, I, th- I think he'd been in a number of different things, including uh, Happy Days. Uh, he was in Never Say Never Again, the Bond movie. Um, I think he was in like Death Wish 9, one of the Bronson Death Wish movies. Death um, Wish 13. I wish I was dead. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if only Bronson had come back for this, I, that would have been. It would great. have been really good. Oh, but yeah, he, he might have been busy with a Death Wish movie. To be fair, to him. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I wish I was in, that he does an exhibition. <laughs> Oi! <laughs> it's, not, it's not even a Bronson impression. It's an impression of the Bronson impression from The Simpsons. That's what gets me. <laughs> That's the only Bronson impression I know. <laughs> Uh, and that, that that basically rounds out the the new dozen. It does as I say, good backstories, but they don't really develop because they're not really important, are they? That's the that's the no. issue here. As you say, that first half or first act does flow quite well, and it hits yeah. beats, and it's reminiscent of um, the training montages and the sequences and some of the interactions from the first movie. Um, even Richard Drakeel's uh, character and and Lee have a little interaction it's word for word their initial um interaction from the first movie where he's like what what does what do you think well i think the first chance they'll get they'll, they'll shoot the major in the back, it's back word ahead, for word. Yeah. but beyond that into two and three it gets gets a little bit confused yeah also before we move on to plot um we've got wolf Keller playing general set dietrich as our big evil baddie he's the most he's one of the most interesting people in the film yes he is not for the actual portrayal, but for like his actual career. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> because not only is he in Raiders of the Lost Ark, which we'll come back to in a second, he was also in Sea Wolves. He was in The Keep. He was in Firefox. He was in Riddle of the Sands as the Kaiser. Oh. He was in an extra in Force 10 from Navarone. And he was in Lost Battalion. So the man has incredible war movie pedigree. It's incredible. Yeah. But we had it, but one of our. Um... One of our patrons, one of our listeners, Ken, uh, he messaged us and he was said, so Kala plays Dietrich in Raiders of the... Herman Dietrich in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm. So are they brothers? Are they twins? And is this movie canon to the... Ra- is Dirty Dozen canon to the Raiders universe? So Sepp Dietrich had a brother who was in the Africa Corps, proto-Africa. Core because they're yep. meant to be Africa core, aren't they? But they're not mm-hmm. really Africa core. Um, yeah, I, I guess that I, that makes a lot of sense. I'm gonna. That's good headcanon. It's good. And Sep Dietrich obviously was a was hit the so- chauffeur and bodyguard in the 30s and, mm. and the 20s. SS general. Yeah. Uh, perpetrator of the Malmody massacre. Big war criminal. All round shit. And um, mm, he's a shit in, in this movie as well. He, let's he not get is, that wrong. He yeah. is. Well, the, all right. Well, let's get let's hit a little bit of plot. Um, he is the general who is going to murder Hitler. He's that general. He's that general, which Lee Marvin and the guys have to stop. You have to get your head around it. At the beginning of the film, Dietrich arrives at a unknown, unnamed chateau uh, that the Germans are evacuating, and he meets a load of generals. And he says, "If you hadn't messed up your plot." which is alluding to the July uh, 20th Valkyrie plot. Yep. Um, then, you know, he, he wouldn't have to. If that bloody chair leg hadn't saved Hitler's life. <laughs> <laughs> then, yeah, well, that leads us back around to, to cast as well, because the, did you notice um, that one of the generals was played by William Morgan Shepard, who I think for my generation is probably best known as the narrator from Medal of Honor. No. The Medal of Honor games. Yeah. I had not made that connection. That's yep. incredible. Yep. He was in loads of movies and, and TV shows. Prolific actor. Um, but yeah, he was he was um, one of the generals in that scene. Um, so yes, plot wise, Lee Marvin and the and the chaps have to go and stop Sepp Dietrich from killing Hitler. Which I don't know why they picked Sepp Dietrich as the person who would kill Hitler, as he was 
I assumed friends with Hitler and quite trusted. Yeah. And the, I don't think there's any historical hint that he was trying to assassinate him. That Maybe I know just because they're close. They're just, they needed yeah. someone who would be close to him. Yeah. Maybe they promised him jewels or Beethoven's piano. Oh, I yeah. Know. I think Beethoven's piano would have thrown it. If, if I was asked, you know, will you kill Hitler? And I'd be like, well, I, I might do. And then they said, well, we can throw in Beethoven's piano. Tink, tinkle the old ivories. <laughs> The reason we mention that is because later on in the movie, Beethoven's piano turns up for some incredibly like plot convenient reason. Doesn't, doesn't that just sum up this film? Yeah. Or the latter half of this film that right. Beethoven's yeah. piano arrives and exactly. a plot point. Um, but yeah, I, should we should we dive into the alley tally and then loop back around for a bit more plot? It's time for Ali Tally on Fighting on Film. So, Rob, Ali Tally, what's your pick for this week? See, my big problem is there's not really anything that remarkable, but there's there's good stuff in it. But it, there's nothing like you know, there's nothing as iconic as an M3 grease gun mm. is to the first movie. Yeah, this movie doesn't really have like an iconography in it. I like the fact that they go in when they go into the mission. They're wearing this sort of pseudo stormtrooper smock, you yeah, know, with the, the, the early flecked on. Yeah, like that camo mm. is really cool. Like the, that attention to detail, so it's at least some sort of disguise for them getting in to where they need to be. But then it, it doesn't really matter in the end. If anyone can hear anything, my dog is snoring next to me. <laughs> so in the uh, in the climactic battle, the, the Hitler's train that they're they're gonna assault and what they've been training for at the start of the movie so that train is actually um the it's a train that lives at the neem valley railway and it's a 1934 german 262 tank engine oh. which at the time of filming had been at the the railway for over 10 years which is just a nice it's a nice little touch so it's an authentic german train which i didn't know That's until cool. i did some research um mp40s and it's the only real weapon of merit. I, I, there's so many MP40s. Reisman makes such a big deal of going, this is the MP40. It's a air cooled 30 round, nine millimeter submachine gun. Eat, eat with it, sleep with it, cuddle it at night, <laughs> check it, you know, fucking treat you like it's your girl back home sort of thing. Mm-hmm, and then they get mm-hmm. given wooden ones for training. Yeah, that's so when like, the what? film starts to lose its cohesion. <laughs> yeah. For me. And, and then when Borgnine comes and goes, the missions, I've been put up the mission a day, we, we go tomorrow. Then Marv is like, yeah, give them the raw weapons. So they got well, like, like a few hours with the MP40. I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah. I, this what? is it. This is where plot holes start to come in. It's um, a classic TV shootout at the end, mm. isn't it? Mm. Um, but, the, I mean, there are some interesting things weapon-wise in there. Um, yeah, the, the wooden guns is weird. It is weird. Um, it's just a bit needless, isn't it? But even weirder, he, he specifically tells... Um, Richard Jekyll's character to give one of the guys an MP34. Yep. Um, which is a completely different gun to an MP40, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, in reality, what he's what they later have is M, is Bergwin MP35 eyes, which are the, uh, I suppose you could call them a, a second line submachine gun. Yep. Yep. Uh, rather, used a lot by SS and um second line mm. troops that's sort of not thing. something you often see in war movies to be no you don't see a lot in war movies you don't see it you don't see them pop up a lot in no. photographs from the war either really um but they were around um but he, he says it in a sort of way where it's like this is something special like it's important um, and it'll be significant yeah. later um but it isn't it's not <laughs> and yeah. it doesn't make any sense um and why they get given wooden two different types of wooden gun the mp40 and the, the mp34 which isn't a 34 Mm. Um, doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, I can understand you not trusting prisoners with, you know, hardened criminal They're prisoners. Giving them wooden guns weapons. bits makes sense, but you yeah. just give them all like a generic shaped MP40 yeah. gun. Yeah, I, I swear to God, I had a wooden gun like that when I was a kid. I think. Yeah, I had a wooden. My mate had a wooden SA80. We used to play. It's quite cool. But yeah. like, yeah, you know, I can get it. But it's just like, yeah, it's a bit of a plot hole, isn't it? But. In terms of MP40s, the most alley thing in the film is, again, truly bizarre but interesting. Um, Lee's character has a shortened MP40 where they've cut like three inches out of the barrel. Um, 
and it's weird because it is not introduced. No. And it's like, here you go, Lee. There's a weird MP40. It just appears because sometimes he's holding the MP34. Yeah. Sometimes he's got MP40. Sometimes he's just got a pistol. Yeah, it's 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 reaching um, Errol Flynn and Objective Burma weapon swap levels. Yeah, yeah. Or that yeah. lad from Forgotten Battle. Oh god. Yes, and Ellie in the lead <laughs> field number four kind of swaps. It, it's back and forth. Um, yeah. But yeah, I I don't know why, but it's cool. It, it's mm. it's weird. It looks yeah. weird. Um, Maybe it's something to do with the flash. The flash was be. bigger for yeah, the camera, yeah, perhaps. It could be. Um, yeah. It's it's just a weird hero gun that isn't in, introduced. There's an effort to introduce another cool gun, which is the um, the sniper rifle, which um, Dregers is given. The suitcase um, K98K. Yeah, the, su- the the takedown suitcase K98K with suppressor, um, which I think is is maybe it's either extremely rare, or it's a rifle grenade launcher made to look like a suppressor or used as a suppressor. Or it's just a mock up by Bapti. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's we know in Bapti, Bapti pull out some really interesting stuff and it could be completely legit. I don't know. Yeah. Um, we'll have to ask them. And he makes he makes uh, the shot, the shot that saves Hitler. Um, <laughs> yeah, for fuck's sake. Yeah, oh my God, that whole bit. So they have, they, have, they deliberate and, and Dregas realises that it's, it's Hitler. Um, yes. And he's like... This is towards the end be... of the movie, by the way. It's, for it is, it's, the, it's the climax. Yeah. He's, and he, he's, he says to Lee, should I not be killing Hitler? And, and you're thinking... Yeah, you probably should be killing Hitler. You, but you could, but yeah. Lee, Lee says, no, no, you got to kill you, you can't. Dietrich. Um, and he does, he shoots Dietrich, and that rifle is not suppressed. No. Um, because it makes a rifle sound when it fires. <laughs> <laughs> God's sake. <laughs> and, yeah. and the shot is is um, well under 100 yards. You could make that shot with a pistol. <laughs> yeah, um, it's very close range. <laughs> Lee yeah. Marvin's cut down MP40. On single shot could take that shot. To be fair, the trains guards have SG forty fours. Oh yeah, that's right, they do. SG forty fours. Yeah. Back to that shot, they could have had a Delisle carbine. And he could have taken a real silent shot. That'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Other than that, there, there was a Gestapo agent at the airfield that they land in, and he had a Czech um, CZ twenty seven little little pistol, which is that's nice. Which is um, definitely a pistol that the Gestapo would have would have had. And I think Marvin has it. In my favourite scene as well. Uh, he might do actually, yeah. I think he does. Yeah, I'll mention it. I'll talk about it more later. Um, because it's the coolest Marvin moment in the film for me. It's the best Marvin moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I like at the end the the home guardsman who um, like greets them at the end of the movie. He's got a mm. this nice twelve gauge side by side. It's quite nice. He does. He does. Yeah. They're going for like a LDV look in forty four. Yes. He um, also, as well as um, Ernest Borgnine. Lee Marvin and, and Richard Jekyll has been in a time warp, and yes. he he he's the last remaining LDV member that never changed, never never quite changed over no. to to Home Guard and, and got the kit. Um, obviously, he must have formed a platoon on his own and has just been out in the fields keeping and keeping things yeah. on lock. <laughs> I know they were going for, but it's weird. I I would have just assumed he was a farmer if he hadn't had a tin hat on as well. But there's and then there's an MG42 as well. It gets quite heavily used by one of the dozen when he's covering them when they leave. And there's quite a yes. funny scene where he turns around and sprays some oncoming German troops, mm. but he's trying to clear a stoppage <laughs> as he does it, and they all fall. So you'd expect the, you'd expect the machine gun sound shout. effect continues. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So you expect Andrew to go cut, we'll take that again. Nope, that's it. That, that's it. Fuck it, we're wrapped. Put that in and the film. To be fair to the guy, he was he was kind of trying to clear that stoppage. But, he but, was, yeah. Yeah, it's quite obvious. It's like that scene in, um, in Austin Powers. It's like just just lay down, son. <laughs> Michael Caine. <laughs> you ain't got you even got a name badge. <laughs> just just lie down. <laughs> Reminded me of that. <laughs> you know, this film was not great when you're referencing Austin Powers in your yeah, war movie. Yeah, the third Austin Powers movie gets a reference. <laughs> on that note, let's move on to favorite scenes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello, Robbie here. Did you know you can support the podcast on Patreon? Join the supporting cast today and gain access to exclusive perks such as discount codes, our monthly Patreon film votes, and the chance to get exclusive merchandise before anyone else. Search Fighting on Film on Patreon or find the link on our website. Thank you. Now back to the show. 
So, Rob, what's your favourite scene? My favourite scene. So, uh, at this point in the movie, um, they've come into they've come into France. They've there's been a big car chase, um, mm-hmm. which is a really good set piece actually. Um, which is the, the, they're in a bus and they're they're being chased by um, men in on on their men in uh, motorbikes and sidecars of MG40 34s on. They're blasting away. That's a really nice set piece for a TV movie. Must admit. Um, but then the middle of the film just gets a bit aimless and they've missed the train. They've got to get from A to B, but they don't know how. They, they steal this car and it's meant to be like a comical moment, but it's all a bit wishy-washy and all a bit weird. And the movie is sort of just like, it's running on fumes a little bit. Yeah. And it's trying to just like set you up for the big end set piece mm-hmm. battle. So it's like, oh God, we've got another half hour to film. Yeah, exactly. It does feel like that. So Marvin is convinced all the lads that they're going to get this Nazi gold or these Nazi Deutsch marks that, that, that's on the train to keep them going because they're constantly trying to kill Marvin in this movie, which is... Okay, before weird. we get to the really good bit yeah. of your fave scene, what the fuck was that bit where he goes... And does, it's like he's pulling it out of thin air. He just goes, there's, there's gold and jewels on the train and if you come with me, we'll get the gold and jewels and you can have them. And they're all like, oh my God, yeah, we'll come. We'll come and do the mission that we were going to do. Um, and it's so bad it just yeah they changed their tune in a minute like yeah. i said earlier the film begins to lose cohesion once he hands out the wooden guns yes after the briefing about real guns the point where they get to and he's having to coerce them with the promise of golden jewels is always a bad sign yeah. <laughs> and then then they get to the the train and he goes by the way by the way guys there's no gold we're here to yeah. kill the general still <laughs> It's like, hang on, don't tell them that now, like at the like, key moment. Lee, it's just no weird. need to tell them. You could yeah. have just done it. Shut up, Reisman. His, his logic being, well, they're here, they'll do the mission. Yeah. Like, no, they're, they're insane or hardened criminals. They'll just go, sod it, I'm off. Yeah. And that's it. Well, know. they do, don't they? They try to. They try to. Them. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, but sorry. Ex- exactly. No, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. So at this point in the movie, they're all excited that they're, they're going to do the mission. They're like, oh, great, I'm going to get West Gold. So they take a little break in this wine cellar or this mm. bar with loads of wine barrels in it. And they're all having like a little bit of drink and they're all going, what are you going to spend your money on? And you get this nice little scene where everyone's like, oh, I'm going to open a restaurant. I'm going to buy this. It's one of the few scenes where you get actually character development. Where they talk to each other. Where they talk to each other. Because if you if you notice, they don't talk to each other. Great no, they have. But there's barely any moments where any of them get any sort of time to sort of say much at all. You know, mm. it's the guy out of Chips and R- uh, Rico Ross's character, um, uh, Dragers. They they get the most to sort of see and do because they're quite integral to the plot. Um, with you know, Dragers being it being the marksman and uh, the guy out of Chips being the be able to fly a plane home. That, that's why mm. they're important. So yeah, get finally getting around to my favorite bit. So they get discovered by a German officer, and he comes in. He's berating them all, saying like, "What are you doing in here? You know why? What? Look at your uniforms." He points out Dregers because obviously, you know he's black. Yep. Point him out, and they're like, "What are you doing here? What regiment are you with?" So they try and cover for him, and it's not going to go very well. And the German officer's like, "How dare you?" And then Lee comes out, <laughs> who's sitting in the <laughs> corner. And he does like some really good drunk acting. And he's like, Actor, Actor, who are you with? Because he's like just repeating what the German says. And he's got this bottle and he's all like swaying all over the shop. And it's quite funny. And he just smashes the bottle over the officer's face. He does this really sort of amdram, like, oh, and like collapses. And then out of nowhere, Marvin, cool as cool as you like, pulls this pistol. And can't like coldly, like a like a mafia type killing, double taps two rounds in the German's head, and then all hell breaks loose, and there's a big shootout. But it's just Lee being Lee in that scene. It's so great. It's it is. I love it. It is, and it's it's one of the few moments in Dirty Two. De- oh Christ! It's one of the few moments in Dirty Dozen Two, yeah, in which you get some of that cold blooded killer yeah yeah from the first movie yeah um obviously they in the first movie they walk through the chateau killing fairly indiscriminately yep um and there's no no batting an eyelid of it and as you say lee glassing the guy and then double tapping him was, so cold was yeah hardcore really it really um, is and, and then that's followed by good. 
it's it's not bad. It it feels a bit like Police Squad or the Naked Gun movies. <laughs> a little tiny bit where they're like up and down, up and down. But but for for, for TV in the eighties, it's not awful. Like it looks. There's a bit enough. where Dregger stands up and and mag dumps and then shouts kill. <laughs> yeah. If you listen, and just, it's not quite a team shooting around everybody. It's it's all right, you know. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I thought for what it was, I quite thought it was quite. No, good. it's fine. And th- there is a bit. There is a slightly funny bit where the Germans all pop their heads up at the same time after everyone stops firing. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they take them all out. Yeah. And then a couple of people are wounded, but then that means nothing to the it next scene. Yeah, because the next just... scene wounded again. Yeah, it's like I think. The editing room is responsible. The editors are responsible for a lot of this because it's just it doesn't need to be in it. Like you don't need to show the lads getting injured. Well, there's another don't. bit where they parachute in. They 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 fly in on a German transport oh, plane, which hell. is oh, quite clearly God. a Dakota, <laughs> which has been painted green. Yeah. And they land and they're nonchalantly walking to the bus, which is driven by a there's a French resistance guy that's managed to drive a bus onto a German airfield. <laughs> That being stopped, and Dregers is is quite clearly. Well, Dregers says, "What the, what are you going to do? Like, I can't exactly yeah. walk out." Yeah, and, and then they bandage him up. Yeah, they bandage um, his head up. There's a Gestapo agent that spots Dregers' hands mm-hmm. and tries to stop the the, the bus, and that in, begins that whole bus chase, which is very um, Weigel's dare. Very, yeah, yeah. Um, MP3s very... out of windows. Yeah, yeah, out the back window. It's it's very very um, where he goes there. Uh, it's good. It's one of my favorite scenes in the film. I don't understand why Lee looks at the driver that's been shot, then decides now is a good time to ignore the fact that the driver's dead and and throw a grenade at the chasing Germans. Yeah, <laughs> and then thirty seconds later, as they're driving towards a very uh, handily placed ramp. Yeah. Um, disguised by trees he then decides to tell one of the the dozen to to take the wheel just a bit too late and then they lose their their bus yeah. transport yeah. but it's a good scene it's that's one of my favorites it's um, a good scene it's a good set do you like is that your favorite scene that's one of my favorite scenes yeah Fair enough. um so matt apart from that apart from that matt is that have you got another favorite bit or a, a genuinely favorite scene or i i i think my favorite scene is beethoven's piano um yeah it's it is funny isn't it um the mission's gone great. Um, <laughs> they've killed Sepp, Sepp Dietrich. Um, Hitler's managed to escape. How Hitler survives that crossfire of... The grenade goes right off by the car that he's Yeah, I don't know in. how Hitler survives, but he does. Yeah. He's probably brought one of those oak tables with him again. Um, <laughs> he's clinging onto a chair leg. They drive <laughs> They off. end up chasing a... I don't know what the plan was with this. Obviously, it was <laughs> Sepp all, Dietrich's train, shop, and Hitler man. was visiting Sepp Dietrich. Yeah. But then Sepp was trying to get Beethoven's first piano or what is described as Beethoven's first piano onto this plane. I don't even know if it is. Because it's driving away from the train. Is the piano coming from the train to the plane? Well, Marvin just makes a remark about it. It's not like it is. He's just No, no, he's saying it's stolen treasure. It's it's priceless artwork and a a musically important piano. And the prison's like, Um, oh, this is just junk. (laughs) It's like, oh, okay, lads. At this point, Beethoven's piano is riddled by machine gun fire. Um, Yeah. But Lee Marvin still stood right in the open chatting about artwork and its value. Um, and that that's that's that no, that is not my favorite scene. I've got to be honest, that is it's so bizarre. But I think for me, I I like the the briefing scene where Lee explains the weapons. That's cool. Yeah. Um, and he, he gives them a rundown. It's um recall operated, which blow like operate, but it's the same. Yeah, I know what he's getting at. Uh, air cooled, 30 round magazine. Len, it's nomenclature. No, Len, it's operation, and it, he's just he's doing he's doing that cool thing where Lee Marvin knows about weapons and he's he's selling it to me. Yeah, so, all the best move, moments of this film are Lee being Lee. Yeah, like and he's the saving grace. He's doing a lot of carrying. You know, if Marvin had back problems after this movie, then I wouldn't be surprised because he fucking carries it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> My second favorite moment from the film is when they parachute in. After not parachuting in, so they land. <laughs> that they is land a massive at, plot hole. That is yeah. awful. That's the worst thing. Um, they land at the the airfield and then they are delayed by the bu- the bus crash. Yep. Um, and they miss the first stop of the train. Um, and then they 
somehow hook up with the French resistance who get them, uh, I assume they get the RAF to fly in and get them a parachute drop. None of these lads are parachute trained, which Lee makes a point of saying in the plane. In the first plane, sorry. And then the net it the cuts to the to them parachuting um with what can only be described as the worst voiceover exposition ever done. And they're like, It is bad. Gee, Major Reisman, why are we parachute dropping when you said we'd all die if we parachuted in? And he doesn't really have a reply. He just says you misunderstood me. Basically. Yeah, it makes no sense. You get the feeling that the film just wants you not to ask why they're parachuting now. No. Why was it? In, yeah. Why was it included? It goes something like, "Oh, um, you misread me. I said you wouldn't be able to jump in if you didn't jump, or something." I, it does not make sense. And I feel like they shot a parachute jump, and then in the editing room they went, "Oh shit, we we filmed a parachute jump." I, well, I'm like, "What? My brain hurts." <laughs> we need to include this yeah. somehow. Yeah. So they it's just smash bizarre. cut from the scene in the church where they're discri- discussing what they're going to do next after a mini mutiny yeah. to parachutes falling and, and them landing on the ground. And luckily, thank God, the RAF has dropped them near the right drop zone and they're yeah. right on top of the train. Um, so, yeah, great. The, the, second, the second act of the film just get very confused. It is really muddled. But for its faults, I do enjoy it. Almost like this episode. Yeah, this this it, it, this is the thing because this movie is just a bit madcap, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So like we're we're just a little bit like dazed. It is. It's like watch the movie twice this week and oh oh one 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 more favorite scene. Oh my one. god. <laughs> so there's this there's, there's a really random scene where they're on the train. Sepp Dietrich's on the train with his aide Camp, his yep. his friend. Um who he makes a very big point of going, my, my close friend, every yeah. time he addresses him, it's bizarre. It's the only scene he gets. He gets two scenes, and that's it. Yes, he gets that intro scene at the beginning with um, the, the narrator from the Medal of Honor games and um, yep. and this one, where they're playing chess, having a, having a drink, um, and his aide confronts him about the possible conspiracy to, to murder Hitler um, to save Germany. And... If you were his aide de camp and his close friend, you'd already know. There wouldn't be any suspicion. Yeah. He'd have looped you in on this. Yes. I'm gonna I'm by the way, I'm gonna kill Hitler. And then we're gonna need to sort of take control of the army. Mm. Um, but no, so yeah, Dietrich gets up to pour himself another drink and he changes the topic and he says to his aide de camp, Oh, I noticed you have a special Luger. Can I look at your special Luger? Yeah, and and the and the guy literally gets his wallet inspected. He he takes out the the, the luger, and he's looking at it. Uh, by this point, Dietrich's drawn his his Walter PPK and sh- and shoots him twice. Yes. So that you know the guy really gets his wallet inspected on this. He sat there going, "Oh yeah, you can look at my you can look, look at my special luger." Oh no, good shot. And that yeah, <laughs> it's, it's so weird. It's like yeah. they just need to remind you that he's evil. It's his aide. He's the one guy in his headquarters that would probably know about the plot to kill Hitler. Yes. And I don't understand why it wouldn't be just some other random general or perhaps the Gestapo agent from the airfield yeah. could have could have played that role. But anyway, the, the moral of the story is don't get out your completely non-special Luga when Sepp Dietrich tells you it's a special Luga exactly. and says he wanted to see it. See, I mean, if you haven't, if you can't tell poor listener, the movie is a bit of a muddled mess after that initial... Yeah quite well done training montage learning who the dozen are once they mm. start the mission and they've done that car chase things do just go a bit haywire so we're not we're not the only people that thought this so uh, after the day of release the new york times wrote a review and i'll just lift some parts from it for you give me 500 words on that new day dozen movie said the new york times film editor <laughs> yeah 500 words go <laughs> Much of the plot seems to be improvised. Andrew V. McLaglin, the director, and Michael Caine, the writer, apparently made it up as they go along. The guy's mission <laughs> is to assassinate a German general who plans to assassinate Hitler. If Hitler dies, a more competent leader might replace him. This would prolong the war. So Marvin trains the guys, push-ups, jogging. It looks like clean good fun. Even in France, the soldiers look like college boys on a naughty toot. Although they do make a ritual obsessance to the old movies. I haven't been on a ride like this since Coney Island. Someone says after a bus turns over. William Bendix would have said that too. 
Unfortunately, plot confusion does set in. The guys are slogging through France, and an instant later, they're parachuting out of a plane. Where did the plane come from, anyway? There's a shootout in a cellar, one of the guys gets hit in the leg, but no one's limping when they come out of the cellar, and so on. The paradox is that it's not a terrible television movie, money was well spent, some of the old equipment, for instance, look, for instance looks pretty good. It may be a white bread war, but at least it won't scare the children. Television has smoothed it out. Mr. Marvin, whose speaking voice now sounds just like Jose Ferrer's, does seem awfully relieved when the whole thing is over. The slabs on his face rearrange themselves in a smile. I think that's a relatively fair review. I kind of agree with m most of that. I, exactly. I don't think he sounds that much like Jose Ferrer, but, but yeah. And that was by John Corey, who was a reviewer at the New York Times at the time. Yeah, I think that's relatively fair. I, I think the one thing that remains constant throughout the film is actually Lee himself. He, he he's, does, he, yeah, he's the standard, isn't he? He's, he holds it together. Yeah, exactly. He's the glue. And I think my true favourite scene is is when... Oh, my God. <laughs> my favourite scene. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I, I, think, I think the best scene is when um, they're confronted by the old gentleman from the LDV, the Home Guard, and he oh, says, yeah. where's the nearest pub? Let's go and get a pint. Yes, Marvin, you old boozound. Go on, son. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best bit of the film. Marvin's like, oh, you know, um, the pub's, he says the pub's closed and Mar I think Marvin's ending line is, well, they'll be open when we get there. He doesn't care. He doesn't give a shit, does he? He's going to go and tell this old chap about the hell of a time he's just had trying to catch a train. Exactly. So, Matt, final thoughts on Dirty Does the Next Mission? Uh, yeah, it's. It, I was just relieved, really, that Lee Marvin did himself justice in this and that yeah. he wasn't phoning it in and it wasn't no, just a day. It felt like he was enjoying himself. He put in a great performance. Um, and while the film loses a lot of direction in the, yes. the latter half... It's pretty aimless at points, I think. It is, it is. Um, it, it, it surprised me that a director of this caliber would end up with something that isn't at least cohesive, even if not yeah. imaginative. I think um, maybe it could be down to the network, it could be down to the editing room, mm. depends how much control M McLagan had. You know, there's, there's it certainly feels so many like there's issues during production mm. at some point. Um, I couldn't find any evidence of what I, they might I have I couldn't been. find much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's an enjoyable film. You can sit down and watch this definitely. Um, yeah, I can't wait for Dirty Dozen three um, to see what Telly brings to this. Telly's um, return. Yeah, yeah, and this this is it for me. So I do quite enjoy this one in, in a sort of guilty pleasure way, where it's just about watchable. You can enjoy it with a beer. You can have you can rip on it with a friend sort of movie. It's it's that kind of feel. Um, it's fun. Yeah. I think it, it's it's just yeah. fun. Um, you know, you can enjoy it if you're a fan of the Dirty Dozen, and you can enjoy it if you're not. It's sort of, it's just, it's that sort of made-for-TV comfort to it. It had a lot to live up to. Yeah, and that's, I think that's the problem. If you're a hardcore, die-hard fan of Dirty Dozen, you're going to hate it because it's, it isn't the sequel that you would want in an no, ideal it scenario. It was 18 years later, so they could exactly. never make the sequel that people would have wanted. Yeah, it's almost like a soft reboot. You know, it, it just, it just about hits all the beats you want it to, but not perfectly. Yeah. But then for its faults, I kind of enjoy it. I mean, I know I've been shitting on it for the last, you know, however long oh. hour. But <laughs> I do still quite enjoy it because Marvin is watchable. Some of the set pieces are decent. It, it's just not that remarkable, unfortunately. And I think that's just no, the it's word. just a TV movie, isn't it? It's yeah, just a TV yeah. movie with a, an excellent actor at the lead of it. Um, exactly. Putting in a decent performance, even if he's, you know, towards the end of his career at this point. You wouldn't know it. He puts in a, no, you a, a great, a great performance, and it, yeah. he has some genuine moments in the film which are really quite enjoyable. Yeah. And I agree. I agree with you. It's a TV movie which could have been better, but was enjoyable. Exactly. Yeah. And we'll see how it shifts next week when we tackle Dirty Dozen: The Deadly Mission. And before we before we end this week, thanks to everyone who's bought a shirt already. We, you know. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Great. I'm on the, so the I'm so pleased with how people have taken it because yeah. when I came up with it, I thought, well. I messaged Rob and I said, should we do a, a, like a special edition Christmas shirt? 
to go, to yeah. coincide with Dirty Dozen December because we're we're for some reason forcing Dirty Dozen to be a Christmas movie. Um, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know where, where this has come from, but it's all good fun. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, everyone that was that has picked one up so far, and mm. they are still available. Yeah, and keep your eyes out on the Twitter and the Facebook pages because we will be running a, a giveaway, a Dirty Dozen themed giveaway in the next couple of weeks. So keep an eye out for that one. And yeah, as always, like, like, subscribe, share, review us on whatever app you're listening on. And we'll catch you next week where we tackle Dirty Dozen 3. The next dozen, or whatever it's called. <laughs> yeah, the bad batch, or whatever it's fucking called. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us on this Dirty Dozen Odyssey, guys. Um, you can find out more about Dirty Dozen December and the T-shirts, which is coinciding with it, over at fightingonfilm.com. And you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter, at fightingonfilm. Yeah, I couldn't say it better myself. We'll catch you next week, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye.